Good evening. Welcome to South Asia Newsline. I'm Usma Jafri. Here are the top stories we are tracking for you on Thursday, the 7th of July. Monsoon rains hit parts of India. Floods cast gloom on Eid preparations in Assam state. U.S. Secretary of State Blinken and Pakistan Foreign Minister Bilawal discuss ways of enhancing partnership. And as external funds dry up for Taliban, young landmine victims may be collateral damage. And now for all the details. Heavy rainfall hit parts of India, including western Maharashtra and southern Karnataka and Kerala states on Thursday, affecting daily activities. The annual monsoon covered the entire country this past weekend. Meanwhile, some flood hit victims in northeastern Assam state said the deluge has cast gloom on the preparations of the upcoming Eid festival. Heavy rainfall continued to hit parts of Mumbai city in India's western Maharashtra state on Thursday, affecting daily activities and leading to water logging. The southwest monsoon covered the entire India last Saturday, nearly a week ahead of the forecast. The weather office has sounded heavy rain alert across Maharashtra for the next four to five days, while civic authorities gear up to cope up with the challenges. The incessant rainfall also affected life in parts of southern Kerala and Karnataka states on Thursday as it cut off several villages. The civic authorities were engaged in clearing roads and relief operations as the heavy downpour damaged several houses and uprooted trees. At least three people were also killed in a landslide in Karnataka's Mangaluru city. Meanwhile, some flood hit victims in Morigaon in northeastern Assam state said the ravaging deluge has cast gloom on the preparations of the Eid al Adha festival, which will be celebrated this coming weekend. They express dismay that they have been rendered homeless and penniless on the streets and cannot buy sacrificial goats for the festival. <laughs> Floods and landslides triggered by incessant rainfall have killed over 180 people in Assam so far. Assam and neighboring Meghalaya state have received 134% more rainfall than the average at this time of the year, according to IMD data. India's financial crime fighting agency conducted raids on over 40 operating sites of Chinese phone maker Vivo in the country this week as part of a money laundering investigation. The Chinese embassy has decried the action. India's foreign ministry spokesperson in response on Thursday said that all companies operating in India need to follow the law of the land. Multiple investigations by Indian enforcement agencies into Chinese companies are damaging the confidence of foreign entities investing and operating in the country, China's foreign ministry said on Wednesday after raids this week by India's financial crime fighting agency targeting Chinese smartphone maker Vivo in a money laundering investigation. Raids were conducted at 44 and operation sites of Vivo and related entities by the ED, the Enforcement Directorate across India, and China was closely following progress, spokesperson of the Chinese Embassy in India said. Such frequent investigation impedes the improvement of business environment in India and chills the confidence and willingness of market entities from other countries, including Chinese enterprises, to invest and operate in India, the statement said. The Chinese directors of a firm, GPICPL, in association with Vivo, fled India last year after the inquiry was intensified, ED officials have said. Many Chinese firms have struggled to do business in India after political tension surged following a border clash in Ladakh region in 2020. India has cited security concerns in banning more than 300 Chinese apps since and toughened rules on Chinese investment. India's tighter scrutiny also led China's Great Wall Motor to shell plans to invest $1 billion and lay off all employees there this month after New Delhi denied regulatory approval for purchase of a factory. 
U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken spoke with Pakistan Foreign Minister Bilawal Bhutto Zardari on Wednesday on relations between the two countries as they seek to repair ties that were strained under former Prime Minister Imran Khan. Both reaffirmed their mutual desire to further strengthen bilateral ties by expanding engagements in different sectors. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken held a call on Wednesday with Pakistan's Foreign Minister Bilawal Bhutto Zardari and discussed bilateral relations and the situation in Pakistan's neighbor, Afghanistan, as they seek to repair ties that were strained under former Prime Minister Imran Khan. According to the U.S. State Department, Blinken and Bilawal also discussed coordination to mitigate the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan, regional stability, commercial and people-to-people -people ties, and impact of the Russian invasion of Ukraine on food security in Pakistan and the rest of the world. The Pakistan Foreign Ministry said Bilawal Bhutto Zardari requested an easing in issuance of U.S. visas for Pakistani nationals. It was the second interaction between the two leaders. They last spoke in May. Khan, who was ousted in a no-confidence vote in Parliament in April, had antagonized the United States throughout his tenure, welcoming the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan last year and more recently accusing Washington of being behind attempt to oust him. Washington and Pakistan's National Security Council, a body of top civil and military leaders, dismissed the accusations. Analysts have said they do not expect the United States to seek a significant broadening of ties with Pakistan's new government, led by Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif, but to remain mostly focused on security cooperation, especially on counter-terrorism and Afghanistan. Moving on. A Germany-based Baloch activist has claimed his father was detained by Pakistani military and spy agencies to muzzle his voice against rights violations in Balochistan. Shehjan said his father, who visited Pakistan in 2019, was forcibly disappeared by Pakistani forces and kept in military cells for over four months and tortured as his son was actively involved in activism. Activists have long blamed Pakistani army and intelligence agencies use enforced disappearances, extrajudicial killings and torture as tactics to silence critics and instill fear. The people who are forcibly disappeared are mainly activists or journalists who criticize government's policies and actions against innocent people. But this seems a new law that they have stooped to in order to harass them. Sherjan urged the international community to intervene and protect all activists and their families living abroad. Uh, I was just uh, always like uh, joining protests or organizing protests or conferences, uh, talking about missing persons and about ongoing human rights violations in Balochistan and about Baloch genocide. This is what Pakistan doesn't want, that mm, they don't want like no one inside Pakistan, no one should speak about Balochistan and Baloch problems and no one should outside also speak. In news from Afghanistan, which is one of the most heavily mine-affected countries of the world, the Taliban's return to power last summer should have helped demining efforts in the country. Yet, foreign governments have now frozen development aid to the Afghan government, unwilling to use their taxpayers' money to prop up the Taliban. As funds dry up for Taliban, young landmine victims, especially children, may be collateral damage. Near a hillside outside Kafas Kali, a small village about 20 miles east of Afghan capital Kabul, mine clearance workers from the Danish Refugee Council in protective ways scan a barren patch of land with the equipment. The workers place a small flag on a barely visible device and then connect it by wires that run hundreds of meters to a small makeshift control center where the countdown begins. The device blows up and the deminers return to their painstaking work. The Taliban's return to power last summer should have helped demining efforts. Yet foreign governments have now frozen development aid to the Afghan government, unwilling to use their taxpayers' money to prop up the Taliban. The loss of demining funds to the Directorate of Mine Action Coordination, DMAC, could have profound consequences for the country of 40 million people.
which is now one of the most heavily mined places on earth after four decades of war. The, the issue of, of land, mined, land mines and unexploded uh, ordinances is a very, very big problem in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is actually one of the most contaminated countries on earth. Hundreds of devices have been detonated in the vicinity around Kafis Kali, but almost 40,000 square miles still need to be cleared. At a Red Cross hospital nearby, the effects of the landmine problem are clear, as dozens of Afghans, including young children, walk across the hallway with their prosthetics. <laughs> Almost 80% of civilian casualties from explosive remnants of war are children, the UN Mining Agency estimates, partly due to their curiosity as well as their regular role in collecting scrap metal to sell to bolster family incomes. According to Paul Haslop, chief of the UN Mine Action Program in Afghanistan, for long-term sustainability, the responsibility of coordinating demining should be with the state and not an outside humanitarian body like the UN agency. With a government that is not recognized, the lack of funding has made the situation very difficult, he added. In news from Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka raised interest rates to the highest level in two decades on Thursday, saying it had to head off runaway inflation to avoid even deeper pain for an economy that is already in crisis and is shrinking. The Sri Lankan Central Bank increased its standing lending facility rate by 100 basis points to 15.50%, while the standing deposit facility rate was similarly raised to 14.50%, the highest since August 2001. Central Bank Governor P. Nandalal Virasinghe said inflation could go as high as 70%, prompting the central bank to raise rates to address the rise in prices. The central bank said in a statement that significant that progress had been made in talks with the IMF while negotiations are underway with bilateral and multilateral partners to secure bridge financing and ease the shortfall in reserves. Sri Lanka is scheduled to present an interim budget to parliament in August which will include new revenue measures and cut expenditure, Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe told Parliament last month. Sri Lanka hopes to hold a donor conference with the involvement of China, India and Japan after a staff-level agreement is reached with the IMF and will present its debt sustainability framework by August. More on news from Sri Lanka. Scores of Sri Lankans have switched to bicycles to commute since the cash-strapped country was hit with a crippling fuel shortage resulting in long queues at petrol stations. A 41-year-old doctor said that the fuel crisis has forced him to buy a bicycle and he has not pumped petrol in weeks. Hundreds of Sri Lankans are ditching their vehicles at home and switching to bicycles to commute and go about their daily lives since the cash-strapped country was hit with a crippling fuel shortage, resulting in long queues at petrol stations. Tushita Kahaduva, a 41-year-old doctor who now hops onto his bicycle to pedal off to work through the streets of capital Colombo, said the crippling long fuel queues convinced him to finally buy a bicycle and since then he hasn't pumped petrol in three weeks. He has outfitted his bike with carriers for groceries and spends hours cycling around Colombo on a daily basis to see patients and conduct his postgraduate research. Faced with severely depleted petrol and diesel stocks, the government last week closed schools, asked public employees to work from home. Economic mismanagement has left people in the island nation unable to pay for essential imports of food, fertilizer, medicine and fuel because of a severe dollar crunch. The country hasn't received new fuel shipments in about two weeks and the government to date hasn't announced when the new stocks will arrive. 
Well, that's all we have for you from South Asia this evening. Now our viewers can watch the show on SouthAsianewsline.com. You can also visit us on Facebook.com slash SAsianewsline and follow us on Twitter at SAsianewsline. That's all in tonight's edition. We will see you same time tomorrow. Good night.